So let's go to the Lord now. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, Lord, you are good. You are faithful. You are worthy of praise, God. And God, we know that through you and only through you can we not only attain salvation, but also have the strength and endurance to persevere in this world. And God, I just want to lift up all the people, family and families and, 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 and friends and whoever in Maui, Lord God. We're praying for them now. Would you protect them, Lord? I pray for the firefighters that are battling that fire. We pray for all those involved. God, we stand with you. We know that you will move in mighty ways. And now, Lord, I pray also for our own hearts, for our own lives here, right here, in your house, God. We're facing other things that may seem like a fire. And I pray, God, that you would give us the strength also to be able to persevere, to be able to go forward with you. For, God, you are great, mighty, and powerful. We trust you, and we praise you. And I pray that you would speak through me, God, and put down my flesh. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week, we started a new series, Face Your Giants, and we've been talking about how to do that. How do we face our giants? And last week, I know we realized, and if you didn't know before, that you have some giants in your life that you may be facing. And we learn what happens when we make the decision and we choose to face those giants. There are things that happen inside of us, inside of our hearts, inside of our minds, the emotions and everything, and we talked about that. And then we talked about how to begin to conquer them, the starting point. The things we need to do there. And today, we're going to look at actually conquering them. How do we do that? How do we get the victory? So that's what we're going to talk about today. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to jump right in in 1 Samuel 17. And we're going to continue. I'm going to start in verse 37 and back up one. But just for those who may be just tuning in with us, you know, King uh, Saul, he's the king right now. He was anointed. But the Spirit of the Lord has departed from him because of his disobedience. So he doesn't have the Spirit of the Lord upon him, and he doesn't have the strength to be able to do what he did before as a king. So David, who is a young boy, and we would even say he's probably a teenager by this point, young shepherd, he has been anointed, but he's not king yet. Not yet. And his father, Jesse, told him to go check on his brothers who were on the battlefield because the Philistines have come to get payback. They brought their champion, Goliath, 10 foot tall, this giant, to come, and he's been taunting Israel, and they are crippled with fear. They don't know what to do. David overhears, and he's like, why is anybody doing anything about this? I'll fight him. I'll do it. And that's where we left off. So in 1 Samuel 17, I'm going to back up one verse in verse 37. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Verse 38. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. As you can see and imagine this, right, he's... Young boy, teenager, and they're putting this armor on him. He put his own tunic on him, dressing him in in this armor. And he's like, I I have never used these before. I haven't tested these out. This is not me. So he says, I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. I haven't tested them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff. Remember, he's a shepherd. He took his staff in one hand, and then he took his sling, he chose five smooth stones from the stream and put them in his pouch of his shepherd's bag, and then with his sling in his other hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. This little guy, right? 
he said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. That's a real key right there. We're going to talk about this later. He says, Come here. I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. He's taunting David. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin and your gods, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Man, he turned that all around, that statement, right back to him. No, I'm going to feed you and your army to the beasts and the birds. And then it goes on. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me. I'll strike you down and cut off your head. I'm sorry, verse 47. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Talk about confidence. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. Can you imagine this and picture this, right? This giant coming, right? He's coming at David. David is this little guy. He goes over, he gets this little thing, right? (laughs) Boom. Boom. Right? You guys like my acting, huh? So when he hit that ground, you can imagine it was like a thump noise. This 10-foot giant, I mean, come on. And it sank into his head, it says. And so then as the Philistine moved closer, I'm sorry, so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard. Or sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with his sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. I love that part. After, you know, David gets over, he cuts off his head. It's like victory. Israelites are like, yeah, let's go. It's like, wow, where was all that courage at before? But David took out this giant with a sling and a stone. But we're going to look at it and see is who really took down Goliath. Now, before we get into this, I want to say last week I misspoke. And uh, uh, I mentioned about Robert Wadlow, and I said he was 9 foot 5. I, I've, I must have read the wrong height when I was researching that. He's actually 8 foot 11. It's not a, it's not a big difference, but still, when I don't like giving false information or inaccurate information, so I'm glad for the member that told me about that. Yeah, so I just want to make sure to clear that up. But let's get into this. What do you need to do to conquer your giants? What do you need to do? First thing is this, remain confident in who God made you to be. Remain confident in who God made you to be. So in verse 38, Saul dressed David in his own tunic, He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened his sword over the tunic and tried to walk around because he was not used to them. He didn't test them. He didn't, and he said, I can't go in these to Saul because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. And so as we look at this, you know, Saul is trying to dress him as a a warrior. I mean, I want you to understand, logically speaking, I mean, this makes sense. You're going into a battle, you need armor right? You got to protect your head. You got to protect your body. Logically, this is correct. So he tries to put this on him, and of course, it doesn't fit, you know. But also, David is like, this is not me. This is not the way God made me to be. So what does he do? He takes him off, and he grabs what he knows, the staff and a sling. And he got, obviously, the the, um, stones in his pouch. He remained confident in who God made him to be in that moment because he knew that's not, God didn't make me a warrior. Not yet. God didn't make me a warrior at this time. Instead of trusting what someone thought they should be, he remained confident in who 
God made him to be. Because that armor would have gave him a false sense of security. And we'll talk about that, what that means. How many people have told you that you have to be like them or do this or do that to conquer your giants in your life? And sometimes not people. How many times maybe you've told yourself? You said, I have to be like this or I have to be someone I'm not. Some of us have had those thoughts. When you're facing the giant of insecurity, and by the way, I think we all have faced the giant of insecurity. Who told us that in order for us to be secure in this life and to conquer this giant, we have to change who God made us to be or designed us to be? Be like this or like that to be happy, otherwise people won't like you. Don't believe what the world tells you or what you may even tell yourself. Remain confident in who God made you to be. I know the world says in order to get ahead in life or enjoy life, you have to step over people. You have to lie. You have to cheat. You have to steal. You have to do drugs or do these stupid, crazy things. And speaking of stupid, I, I don't understand how this social media platform is still able to be alive, so to speak. TikTok? How many of you know what TikTok is? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. Let me explain this to you a little bit. TikTok leads other social media sites among the youth in the U.S. as 47% of their user, users are aged 10 to 29. 50%. Some parents think they're raising their kids. If they have TikTok, that's what's raising them. Let me share with you a little bit of the challenges that TikTok has trending. There's a challenge, and some of you may know this, some of you may not. There's uh, this, I guess, group called Kia Boys. And this trend has participants hotwire a car, commit crimes with it, get it totaled, and then return it. Now, that sounds dumb, right? You're like, why would anyone think to do that? People are actually participating in it. Kias and Hondas. It's crazy. Let me share this with you. It's called the Coronavirus Challenge. That alone, you wouldn't want to mess with, right? This challenge began when a woman licked a toilet seat on a plane and posted it online. I don't make this stuff up, y'all. I'm, I'm just, just saying. So then what happened? Well, the challenge is to lick things that you normally wouldn't lick. Disgusting. Why would we want to do things like this? Is not the way God made us to be. But yet, for some particular reason, we feel as though, or or maybe we've heard or seen or whatever, that we have to do these things in order to be popular. Or I, I don't know. I know the world tells us for us to conquer these giants that we have to put on a mask and a front and look. No. We need to be the way God made us to be and not the way people think we should be. And by the way, this goes on one end of the spectrum all the way to the next. Two extremes. God made us to be good. But the problem is because of sin, we don't know what good is or what good looks like without God. And we're seeing it very clearly. In Genesis 1.27, so God created mankind in his own image in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Friends and families, there's only two genders, male and female. Now, there are anomalies because of sin, but it's rare. But here's the thing, when God made everything, what did he say? It is very good. Before sin entered the world, of course, sin destroyed it all. Colossians 1, 15 to 16, the Son, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, rather thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. We're all made in the image of God, but sin broke that image. Jesus Christ came to the world as in, in, in perfection. 
He is the image of the invisible God. And we bear that image. We need to live out that image. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, his handiwork, his uh, 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 masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works, which God prepared beforehand at the beginning that we should walk in them. For good works, not evil works, not sin works, good works. That's why we were made in the image of God, to live out and bear his image. You may not be the tallest, the smartest, the strongest. You may not have many gifts, you know, but look, and you may even have a disability. God made you special. You're not a mistake. God made you special. Do you know you have your own unique fingerprint? No one in the world has your fingerprint. That should tell you something. God made you for a purpose higher than your own. And when God is on our side and we're willing to be used by him, and of course he's willing to use us, be confident in who God made you to be. Don't allow anyone to pressure you or persuade you otherwise. If David would have kept this armor on and went on knowing that's not who he is, he's like, he knows it, and he kept that armor on, had this false sense of security, there's no way he would have been able to defeat this, this giant. Why? Because he would have relied on the armor, the physical armor, instead of who was actually with him, the Lord God Almighty. Instead, what did he do? He says, no, I can't go on those. Get my staff, get what I know, and I'm, I'm going with God trusting in him. I'm going to give two examples, real life examples, that I think will encourage us this morning. You may know both of them. The first one is Bethany Hamilton. How many of you know about Bethany Hamilton? If you don't know, she's a surfer. And at 13 years old, I mean, man, great surfer, okay? That's, a, that's an understatement. 13 years old, she had her arm bitten off by a shark. 13 years old, her left arm completely gone. As you can imagine in that traumatic experience as a 13-year-old, a teenager, hard. The things she may have thought that went in her head, the things people may have told her. But you know what? That didn't stop her. <laughs> Did not stop her. This, this giant that she was facing in her life, she remained confident in who God made her to be, and God pulled her through. You can read her story. You can, she has movies. I mean, you know, all that. The second one I want to talk about is Nick Vujicic. Probably butchered his last name, but he was born with no limbs, no arms, no legs. You think you have it hard. He tried to kill himself multiple times. I mean, why was I born? What's the point of my life? He believed the lies, you know, that was being told to him and what he thought in his own life. But when he faced this giant, he remained confident in who God made him to be. He is now an, Aust well, he's been like this for years, but Australian-American Christian evangelist speaking for God. They both have families, Bethany and him. Man. I say this to encourage you this morning that no matter what giant you may be facing, you can face it with confidence, remaining confident in who God made you to be and standing with him. You don't have to be like anyone else or think you have to be like anyone else because the key to these people, as I mentioned, is they trusted God with their lives and went forward. But how can we do this confidently? You know, we can say this, but how do we do this? And I want to give you a point for this. Set personal time aside to spend with God. Set personal time aside to spend with God. Let me ask you, how much time are you spending with the Lord? And I'm not talking about just being here at church. This is good. We need to be together in corporate worship. We need to hear the word. We need to be fed. But I'm talking about the quiet time where it's just you and God. How much? See, that's the time where you grow in your relationship. In any relationship in the world, the more time you spend with someone is how you grow, how you learn, and all of those things. As you spend time with the Lord, you will become more and more confident in who God made you to be. But also you will understand why 
why God made you, how God made you, all of that is going to come out when you spend time with the one who made you. You want to know why there's so many confused people in the world? Because they haven't spent time with the one who made them. They don't have a relationship with the one who made them. When you think about your parents, I don't know if you know this, but you have 50% of your parents' genes. So 50% from your dad, 50% from your mom. So if you're a kid in here and you want to know how you're going to be in the future, just look at your parents. You're not going to be exactly like them, but you're going to have a lot of their traits. And in my life, I've noticed there are times where I speak or I talk and I sound like my dad. I'm like, and I catch it, I'm like, oh, man, I sound like my dad right now. <laughs> And there are other times where when I panic, I'm like my mom. I, I, I jump from zero to 60 real quick, and I think the worst case scenario, <laughs> and my mom knows that. But why do I bring this up? God made the world and created everything we see before us. And as we read earlier, he made us in the image of himself, and we had a perfect relationship with the one who made us in the beginning. But because of sin and disobedience, we are separated from God. And we were separated from him. Sin messed that all up. We no longer have that relationship. But in Christ, when we receive him by faith, we are now back in relationship with him because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us, dying for our sins. And so now we're back in relationship with him. And through the power of the Holy Spirit of God and and through Jesus Christ's sacrifice, we have a relationship with the Father. Are we setting time aside to spend with the one who made us? Or are we just too busy? You want to know why David was so confident? He was so confident in who God made him to be? Because he spent precious time with the Lord. You know he's the one who wrote the majority of the Psalms, the songs and prayers. How was he able to do that? Like when you read it, you're like, man, you can feel his heart in, those, in the scriptures, obviously. Why? How? Because he spent his precious time with the Lord. But you know what? Our prime example is not David. Who's our prime example? Jesus Christ. Amen. How much time did he spend with God, the Father? Matthew 14, 23. I'm not going to read all the verses. I'm just going to read this one. But there's a lot of verses of him spending time with the Lord. But this is before, I'm sorry, right after the feeding of the 5,000, before he walked on water. After he had dismissed the crowd, the crowds and dismissed them, he went on the mountainside by himself to pray. In other words, spend time with the Lord. Later that night, he was there alone. And when you read the context and everything, you realize he was up there for hours. It wasn't just a few minutes or just one hour. No, no. Hours he spent on that mountain with God. And, of course, like I said, many other times in public, before meals, before healing, after healing. I mean, there's so many times. If you want to be confident and understand who God made you to be, then spend time with the Lord and say, look, make it a priority. Make it a priority. It doesn't matter when. It could be lunchtime at work. It could be before work in your car. It could be when everyone's asleep. It doesn't matter. Just make sure you make it a priority and you spend that time. The battles we face are not just physical but spiritual. So the giant you're facing it's not just physical, it's spiritual. And I would even say it's more, it's more spiritual than physical. So what does that mean? Well, we need God's help, right? We need to seek the Lord. We need his help. Ephesians six twelve. For our struggle, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Friends and family, it's not just what we see in front of us, but there is a spiritual realm, what we can't see, that we're battling again. Make sure you're setting that time with the Lord. But that leads to the second thing. What do, you need, what do you need to do to conquer your giants? Rely on and trust in the power of God. Rely on and trust in the power of God. So verse 41, he has his, his staff, his sling, the Philistine is coming with him with all he has. He looked David over, taunted him. He's like, what are you doing? Come to me with sticks. What, are we going to play a game? He's like, you're going to throw it so I can go play catch or what? What, what is this? This little guy coming at me. And he cursed him with, by his gods. 
Right? He's like, I cursed him by his gods. And then what does David say? You come against me, sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of ar- the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Whose power is David relying on and trusting in? God's power. Amen. He doesn't say, oh, yeah, you have all that, but I have this custom slingshot that I made, put together by myself, posted it on social media. Everybody liked it and everything. I'm ready to go. No, he didn't say none of that. No. He says, I'm coming against you in the name of the almighty Lord God. And Saul, who was, of course, trying, like I said, put that armor on him, and he's like, no, no. I'm remaining confident who God made me to be. So relying on and trusting in his power. So the question is, who are we trusting in and relying on to conquer our giants? Because a lot of us are relying on and trusting in ourselves, our own strength, our own intellect, our own expertise. And we need to realize that we only get the victory in Christ when we are relying on his power and by faith trusting he can do it. And we know he can. In his will, of course. Relying on means, relying on his power means relying on his will and trusting him with the outcome. That's what that means. Because the giant was relying on his own power, his own strength, his own gods, and all of that. And David relied on the power of the one and only God, the true God. Like I said before, this is spiritual, not just physical. This was to show God's power. And so here's my question to you. Who defeated Goliath? Was it David who... Use a slingshot, or was it God? Hmm. David is the one who defeated him with the slingshot. But the whole point of this story, what we need to understand is that the person who slung the stone was a man relying on and trusting God. So who ultimately defeated Goliath? God did. God gave David the victory. I mean, because if you really believe a measly stone took out a 10-foot Goliath, giant, come on, (laughs) that's a miracle in itself. I mean, he had it, either David was super buff and that stone was going 100 miles per hour, I mean, wow, or that stone was this big, I mean, you know. (laughs) When we choose to rely on and trust in God's power, God will give us the victory. It doesn't matter what people think or say, because people are going to tell you. It's going to be like, man, I don't think you're able to do that. I don't think you can do this, because it looks impossible. These were impossible odds right here. And people are going to say that about, you know, what you're doing. When you choose to face your giant, they're going to say, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. That's not what my God says. There is nothing impossible with God, right? He can do anything. Ephesians 6.10 Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. David might not have had that physical armor on, but he had God's armor and God's power behind him. And God gave him the victory. And you might not have all of the things, all of the things that the world says you need, you need to have, but with God and his power, he can give you the victory. You know, you hear what the doctors tell you or what your peers tell you, but if you rely on and trust in God's power, get ready for God to move. But at the same time, there's something else we have to do. We need to step up to our giants and confront them. Step up to our giants and confront them. It comes to a point where we actually have to step up and confront are giants. That means we need to do something. David said, I'll do it. I'll, I'll fight him. But it had to come to a point where he actually had to run out and fight him. And some of us will say, yes, I'll do it. And yes, I, I rely on and trust in God's you know, power, but haven't even confronted their giants for whatever reason. They haven't moved. They haven't done anything. If we're relying on and trusting God's power, then why haven't we confronted our giants yet? Now, some of it may be circumstantial. I get it, you know, time or whatever the case is. But what are you waiting for for those times that you can? Step up and confront your giants while relying on and trusting in God's power. Stand with the Lord. 
I know there's fears. I know there's anxieties. We talked about this last week. But stand with God. God has you. Trust him. You know, when you think about the giants, you know, I don't know what you may be facing, but, you know, that may mean getting up, getting up and going to the doctor. Get up and put in the application at that job that, said, that everybody said you would never have. Stand up and, and be parents protecting your kids. Stand and tell the truth. Step up and confront your giants. Like I said, I don't know what you're facing today. Joshua 1, 9, you're not going to have this on the screen, but if you remember, what did God tell him? Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now, you know in context what that was for. Joshua was going to conquer the promised land. God was going to use him to do that. That was a, that's a giant. because That land was filled with strong people. And God is with all those who believe and we can stand and face our giants, step up and confront them. Now, the bottom line for all this and the theme of this whole story in verses 46 through 47, the bottom line is conquering your giants helps everyone know that the battle belongs to God. Conquering your giants helps everyone know that the battle belongs to God. Look at verse 46 through 47. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Then he goes on, all those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you all into my hand. Through what David did, it let everyone know. Everybody on the battlefield know, the Israelites know, that the battle belonged to God. It's not you who is going to defeat this giant. It's going to be God working through you to defeat this giant as you trust in him. Everyone saw that David was younger, smaller, not even experienced, not even one bit. He's never been on the battlefield. Yet he did the impossible. And as you step up and confront your giant, and as you conquer them, it's not just meant for you, but everyone around you. Because people are going to see and they're going to be like, man, how did you do that? Like, I, I don't understand. How did you do that? And then guess what? That's a gospel opportunity. That's where you can tell them how. David knew it wasn't him. That's why he said this. He knew it wasn't him. He knew it was God. And that's a, I, by the way, that's a test for us. What are you going to say? Oh, you know, it's because of that slingshot I made. You know, I told you it was custom. You know what I mean? You don't see these biceps? I work out. Man, it's me. Or are we going to give God the glory that's due? Because we know it wasn't us. It was him. Going back to what I said about Bethany and Nick, why are they so well known? Is because they went against the impossible with the power of God. And when you talk to them, you read their stories, they're not claiming that they did it. They're giving it to, to God. But also, I want to say this about conquering. Sometimes we think conquering means always winning. And what, is really what it means, conquering does mean winning ultimately. But sometimes conquering our giants of eternity means losing, might mean losing. And you may say, wait, what? Maybe in your situation, losing is probably how you're going to be able to conquer your giant. Or help you to see that that's not the real giant. Because maybe the giant you're facing was caused by bad decisions that you made. Or maybe it's by your ego or arrogance or whatever. And maybe you losing that job or that relationship or losing the battle Maybe actually what God intended for you is for you to see. And the reason why I say this is because sometimes we think that if we don't win, then God messed up or I did something wrong. And remember what we said, don't expect 
things to go exactly, right, the way you think it should go. It may be exactly the way God intended for you to realize and see something in you and and so that way you can see who the real giant is. It may have been really you and not what you think. So I just want to put that in your brain is to think about that in your situation. Because ultimately the biggest giant in this world that we will all face is the giant of death and sin. And there's only one person who has conquered that. That's our short Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen to that. John 5, 24. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and, may, and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Have you crossed over? Because you may win every battle on this side of eternity, but if you don't have Christ, you lose in the end. But if you lose every battle on this side of eternity, but you have Christ, you win. You get the victory. This Goliath, right, this giant was claiming his gods and cursing him with his gods and what he had. And there are people in our world today that think the gods are going to save them, but it's not by our means that we are saved. It is not, you know, we don't tell God how we get to heaven. He tells us how we get to heaven. It's his heaven. There's only one God that saves, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who conquered sin and death. In 1 Corinthians 15, let's read this together. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Jesus Christ. I was going to say Savior, my bad. Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Make sure you have the victory over death and sin. That only happens in receiving Jesus Christ. But as we go through this life on this earth and the giants we face, remain confident in who God made you to be. Make sure you set that personal time with God. Rely on and trust in his power. And make sure to step up and confront those giants in your life. God will give you the victory in due time in his will. But we just got to make sure we stay focused on him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, I don't know what everyone may be facing in their life, Lord. It may be medical issues or, you know, maybe personal things going on, family issues, Lord God. I just don't know. But I do know that you will give us the victory as long as we trust you, rely on your power, continue to go forward with you, walking with you, God. Lord, not allowing this world or anyone to persuade us or put these thoughts in our head, and even our own. We do it ourselves. God, I pray for protection because the enemy, we know, goes around like a roaring lion looking for those to devour. And God, for those who may be here and they have not received you, they don't have your power in them, I pray, God, that they would say right now, Lord, I confess I'm a sinner. I've done wrong things. Lord God, please forgive me, Lord. I want to commit to follow you. I believe. Would you make that your prayer today and make sure to tell someone? God, help us all to stand strong on you and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name.